Okay, uh, out of memory must fail fast. Today, most programming languages fall into one of these two categories. JavaScript, for example, uh, the specification never mentions the possibility of out of memory. So JavaScript, the JavaScript specification can only be implemented correctly on an infinite memory machine. And those are in quite short supply. Java, on the other hand, um, will throw an out-of-memory error, which is a catchable error, uh, and some JavaScript engines do that as well. Um, and uh, Java goes further, and the out-of-memory error is a category called virtual machine error, and the explicit JVM contract is that, an, uh, is that a virtual memory, uh, sorry, is that a virtual machine error can be thrown between any two instructions or some correspondingly fine-grained unit of atomicity. I'm not quite sure what the precise phrasing is. But the point is that if a catchable error can interrupt computation unpredictably at such fine-grained units uh, and computation can proceed after the catching of that error, it's impossible to write a correct program for that language. As an example, Here's a uh, you know, computer science 101 doubly linked list splice where we um, have a noted doubly linked list left and we're splicing into the doubly linked list to the right of left the node new right. So the first three lines of the function are not problematic. New right is modified to point into the old list. Uh, the next line uh, modifies lift, list, left dot right to point at new right. And at this point, the doubly linked list is ill-formed. Uh, uh, in general, as we go from one consistent state to another, uh, we often have to, to make multiple modifications to get to the next consistent state. And those modifications have to be made one at a time. And between those steps, we're in an inconsistent state. So if uh, between modifying left.right and modifying old right.left, we do something that provokes an out-of-memory condition, and that condition is caught, and this doubly linked list data structure is still reachable by the computation that proceeds from catching it, you're toast. You have, you have unpredictable confusion. You, you, you don't know what is corrupted. Uh, you have no ability to, for, there's no ability for execution to proceed in a meaningful and robust manner from that point if some arbitrary data structure that is reachable from you might be corrupted in ways that you cannot expect. You might think that the same try-catch or try-finally logic could be used to repair uh, the inconsistency, but even this trivially simple example uh, shows how hopeless that is. If you're going to, to put the problematic part that's the, 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 the little section during which the state is inconsistent inside a try-catch to try to repair it in the catch or final clause, what the hell did you write? There's really nothing sensible to write there. Uh, and even if you did come up with something sensible to write, well, the out-of-memory condition might happen again at any point inside your catch or finally clause, so this is not really a workable example. Workable means to, to repair broken state. Today, I can reveal the following exploit that we've been sitting on in responsible disclosure for a month. Um, uh, this, the, the we here being a um, collaborating group of several companies, including uh, Agoric and Salesforce uh, and Figma and others. Um, we had a responsible disclosure a month ago against the, uh, the Realms Shim. Uh, the Realms Shim creates a sandbox around code evaluation where uh, inside the sandbox code, when it says eval, it should only get the safe evaluator, the evaluator constructed by the Realms Shim. Uh, this code uh, run as, as sandboxed code caused an out of memory in a crucial point in the execution inside the realm shim 
uh, before um, when, it's, when a flag had been flipped one way and not yet flipped back, uh, uh, and then caught the error following which the realm shim mechanism was in an inconsistent state in such a way that they were able to then use the name eval to get a hold of the original unsafe evaluator, which was a complete breach of the sandbox. Clarifying question. Yeah. Uh, I would not consider the previous thing in Oom. Uh, engines just limit the depth of the stack, but that's different from running out of memory. Uh, uh, is, that is, are you intending to cover both? I'm intending to cover both. Okay. Um, uh, the JavaScript. I, I did not understand that there was that people uh, uh, use different terminology for running out of stack versus running out of heap. Uh, to me, both of them are forms of memory, and neither of them are acknowledged by the specification. It's, it's not like running out of stack space. It's that there is a number of functions that can be on the stack, no matter how many things, like how I much see. memory each of them holds. Okay. Like it, it's, it's just a bound on the number of functions. It's okay. not like related to memory. Okay, so so yes, I'm I'm intending to include that, and if you have a suggestion about better terminology to make it clear that that's included, uh, that would certainly be welcome. Yes. Uh, how does this work? Is uh, is the fun top function a tail call or not? Ah ha 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 Oh God, that's funny. Uh, if this was run on a conforming JavaScript system. Uh, which Apple provides and nobody else does with regard to the tail call issue, uh, this exploit would not have happened. Um, however, obviously, you could transform this program into one for which the recursion is not in tail position, in which case the exploit itself would still happen. So, so it doesn't change the point of the exploit. But you're right, the actual code would not have failed uh, had the underlying JavaScript engine actually conformed to the tail call part of the spec. I'm sorry? Yes. Um, that's very funny. So, uh, but in any case, since the, the point of the exploit uh, is still there, the exploit is trivially rewritten to, to apply to any JavaScript platform. Um, and the flaw here is that following the unrecoverable uh, uh, situation, um, uh, the virtual machine throws a catchable error and the attack code was able to catch the error and then continue execution. And the particulars of the mechanism underlying the realm shim is the eight magic lines of code that I, that I explained at a previous ECMAScript meeting. Uh, and the, the core of it is that the eval call at the bottom is the thing that's evaluating the sandbox code. The sandbox code uh, is, the, one, is the, the code that's the contents of the SRC variable, the source code variable. Uh, so that eval has to be a direct eval. Uh, the directive, it has to be a direct eval so that, the, so that the sandbox code is evaluating within the scope of the, of the enclosing width, which, um, which captures, which, um, uh, uh, in, which um, yeah, captures all scope lookups and, and turns them over to the scope handler. Um, uh, so shown on the right, uh, but in order to do that, the eval, the lookup of the name eval itself, in order to do the direct eval, has to be looked up by the scope handler by the same width, dereferencing it to the original unsafe eval, the box in the red. So the way we did that, we, the way we did this in the realm shim, at the point when the responsible disclosure was reported to us. Uh, is that we have a switch in the scope handler that before entering these eight magic lines, um, uh, we flip the switch to say the very next time somebody looks up the name eval, give them the unsafe eval. But as soon as you do that, remember to switch back to safe mode where any further lookups of the name eval give you only the safe eval. Um, uh, the reason we can publicly disclose this now, we publicly disclosed all uh, this exploit and our fix yesterday. Um, uh, the reason we can publicly disclose it is because we fix the symptom um, by making the scope handler logic uh, uh, much less stateful. Uh, JF in particular uh, behind you, um, uh, he fixed this. Um, and, um, but we should stress that we're fixing a symptom of the underlying problem. Uh, the underlying problem of 
causing inconsistent state, catching the error, and then exploiting inconsistent state is something that we're going to be chasing forever as long as out-of-memory errors are catchable. So what we're, what we're proposing is that uh, the out-of-memory condition uh, is one that causes immediate termination of the corrupted unit of computation. So what is the unit of computation that needs to be immediately terminated? Um, uh, well, clearly, it's not just the call stack, because that's what throwing the exception does, and that's not adequate. Um, uh, the contagion of unpredictable corruption is basically synchronous access. So over here, we have the picture of the way JavaScript used to be, where you have objects and agents, where objects, so the blue dots are objects, the green rectangles are agents, and multiple objects in the same agent can interact with each other synchronously, which is the, excuse me, which is the red arrows, uh, but an object in one agent can only interact asynchronously with objects in other agents. Uh, and uh, this means that under that picture, the agent is a perfectly viable unit of preemptive termination. And this is exactly the Erlang model. Uh, the Erlang process, uh, the process when it hits an unrecoverable condition uh, is immediately terminated. Uh, no further uh, code within the process executes. So the fact that it's in an inconsistent state um, uh, is not observable. Uh, after that point within the process, and then other processes are only asynchronously coupled to that process, and the other processes now have the burden of reacting to the sudden absence of that process. So there's still a burden to recover um, uh, functionality, to recover from the condition, but it's, a, but it's a burden that can be met because the entities that are reacting to the absence are only asynchronously coupled to the absent computation. However, we no longer have quite as simple a picture. We add shared array buffers to the language. With shared array buffers, multiple agents can be coupled to each other synchronously. And now we get into a bunch of open questions with regard to the precise semantics of shared array buffers. If one side of the shared array buffer is preemptively terminated at an arbitrary point in its execution, uh, are, is, are the other agents on the other side of that array buffer in an unrecoverable situation such that they have to be considered coupled together as to one joint unit of preemptive termination? Or can we somehow refine the specification of array buffer uh, so that the uh, other side of the array buffer is not un uh, uh, unrepairably corrupted? And I don't know the answer to that. I propose that that, uh, that be part of the investigation here. There's also the question of um, if it is contagious through, through shared array buffers, uh, do you do it according to the entire agent cluster, which is all the potential sharing relationships, or do you track the actual sharing relationships and have it be contagious by the actual sharing? All of these are open questions. There's the issue about uh, once something has been terminated, how does the system as a whole continue operation? How does it recover from the fact that some component has been preemptively terminated? Well, to a large measure, that depends on the host. That's a host decision. Like in the browser, um, uh, you can imagine that pages get refreshed or just the tabs become declared dead. Uh, the site isolation practiced by browsers that was motivated by uh, Meltdown Inspector might nevertheless be useful to um, uh, 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 create a boundary with regard to what units you have to preemptively terminate. Uh, maybe you, you don't have to terminate across the site isolation boundary. Um, for, um, for other hosts, uh, for a device, for example, um, uh, what devices do right now when, the, let's say, a watchdog timer runs out is the device gets rebooted. You could imagine that it might be useful to also just reboot the device if it runs out of memory. Uh, in, a in a system in which you have all the 
uh, bookkeeping to support affordable transactions like JavaScript run on a blockchain, uh, you could imagine that these conditions cause transaction abort, and then the computation falls back to a previously consistent state and moves forward from there. And then what uh, Erlang shows with its supervisor architecture, uh, and likewise the Kikos operating system with its very similar keeper architecture, uh, is that you can create abstractions in the language for some code to create units of computation uh, that, are, that can fail preemptively, such that the creating code can, can arrange how the termination of the created code is handled. So, so the, the approach that we're going to show, very much again, still following the Erlang and Kikos model, is it can be thought of as a generalization of the philosophy that we've already taken to weak reference finalization, which is the post-mortem philosophy. Uh, Java finalizers um, uh, from inside the finalization, the condemned object is still accessible, and that has uh, only caused trouble. Uh, in the weak reference post-mortem finalization, the condemned memory is never again accessible from anything, including the finalization logic that's reacting to the condemning of that memory. Uh, uh, likewise, with um, uh, with the supervisors or keepers is they run on se a separate set of resources and they run in reaction to the preemptive death of something that once it dies uh, is no longer reachable from the logic for recovering. So in the same way that um, uh, the, realm, uh, the realm's proposal proposes an in-language reification of the specification concept of a realm, uh, we can imagine a similar language level reification of the specification concept of an agent or an agent cluster or whatever the right units are, uh, such that when you create, let's say, an agent cluster, uh, that you can provide it as an option, an out-of-memory keeper, such that the agent cluster is, is allocated out of a different budget of memory. Uh, when it runs out of memory, it gets preemptively terminated, but then the keeper gets immediately invoked so that uh, recovery processes outside the condemned computation can then proceed to recover the overall functionality of the system. And this, this is very much in line with um, uh, lots of uh, high reliability systems, uh, not just Erlang, but things like uh, tandem nonstop at the hardware level, uh, that if you're trying to build high reliability systems, it's very good to build them out of uh, fail-stop components. Um, if, you, if you immediately terminate uh, the computation once unre unrepairably confused, then that that comp the, comp the terminated unit of computation is a fail-stop component. If you allow it to proceed from there, instead, while it's in a confused state, it's no longer a fail-stop component. It becomes much harder to use it as a component within an overall fault-tolerant system. And now I will stop recording.